Hollywood, California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. A minor case of murder, another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger is my stock and trade. If you're on a spot nailed there tight, you need my kind of help, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, Esquire, one of the members of our Bearcat Social Club suddenly finds himself in a very embarrassing predicament. With more exactitude, he is in the can for murder. Now, knowing his fellow Bearcat as we do, we are convinced that he is innocent. Therefore, we are hiring you to prove sane. As a starter, there is a hundred bucks in it for you. If that isn't enough, there's more where that can be. The address of our headquarters is 19 and a half Duane Street, and it's signed Chuck Wilson, acting captain. George, this sounds like a letter a kid wrote. But to quote from this provocative communique, a fellow bear cat is in the can for murder. That's not kid stuff, Brooksy. That depends on just how old this fellow bear cat is. Oh, they get old early down there around Duane Street. Well, we haven't had a social evening in a long time, darling. Would you suggest we drop in at the club? Uh, with great exactitude, I answer. Yeah. <laughs> Golly, I hate to think where they dug up that money for your fee. <laughs> Stop sounding like a policewoman, Angel. All the bear cats just got together and raided their piggy banks. Nice place you got around here, Chuck. Uh, it's just an empty store we fixed up. Yeah, look at that furniture we got. See that red plush chair? Right out of the lobby of the Piccadilly apartment. Shut up, Barney, will you? Valentine, I believe in getting right to the point. And that's the way I like to do business, too, Chuck. What's on your mind? Now, look, Dan Corey is the real captain of the Bearcats. Uh-huh. The cops got him jugged for shiving his stepfather. For what? Uh, it's shiving him, lady. You know, pushing a knife in him. Oh. Yeah, but he didn't do it, Valentine, even if he said he did. Oh, he admits he did, huh? And just what kind of a miracle do you expect from me, fellas? Uh, just to believe what I'm saying and find out what really happened. Well, I'm here to listen. Well, the bear cats have our own special rules, see, and we don't go back on them. Yeah, that's right. Let, let me read them to you, Valentine. Uh, yeah, okay, Barney. Uh, uh, the guy that goes looking for trouble, unless it comes your way, is going to get their tails kicked in. Well, there's nothing wrong with that rule. Uh, try never to cop anything unless it's from an enemy gang. The fine for violating this rule is one buck. Well, there might be some question about that rate. Well, get to the one we're talking about, will you, Barney? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. A lead pipe, baseball bats, and other harmless things is okay. But don't carry dangerous weapons. You might be tempted to use them and give the club a bad name. Oh, yeah. Nothing like trying to stay out of trouble. Uh, violate this rule and you get thrown right out. Yeah, now, Danny made that up himself, see? And he'd rather let you break his arm than break one of his own rules. Okay, Chuck, let's say I believe you. And Danny confessed to the police for reasons of his own. Yeah, that's right. Now, can you think of anyone in the neighborhood who'd want to kill Danny's stepfather? <laughs> Just about everybody. His stepfather was nothing but a phony. Always pushing people around, even Danny's mother. Yeah, but for who did the babes go for him? Look, why don't you drop dead? Don't you see we got a lady present? Huh? Oh, don't let me cramp your style. What else about Corey? Well, he was in some kind of a racket with Leo Sudan, see? They worked out of the suite's pool room on uh, Malone Street. Uh-huh. Well... You going to take it on, Valentine? Um, what would you say, Brooksy? Well, George, I'd say if so many of the other guys are so sure about Danny being innocent, they may have something there. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking something like that myself. Brooksy? Yeah? You drop in and see Danny's mother. Uh, she lives just down the block, number 33. And why don't you do that, Angel? I'll get out of the jail and have a talk with Danny. <laughs> Just what did happen that night, Jenny? The story's the same every time they make me tell it. Uh, I came home that night from the club. The key was in the door, so I just walked in. Yeah? Well, my... I mean, the man who married my mother was leaving. He had his bags all packed. I knew right then he was throwing her over. So yeah, I... No. But how is it the police didn't find the knife? Well, I threw it in the river. Yeah? Why'd you go to all that trouble, Jenny? And then walk up to the cop on the beat and confess. I don't know. I guess I was just half crazy. 
Oh, I see. So now you know. I don't think I know anything about you yet, Danny. I think you're holding out on me. All right, never mind about me. But do you think you're playing fair with Chuck, Barney, and the others? Think of those guys. Getting up all that dough and then hiring you. Well? Ah, oh, they're nuts, all of them. And don't think I'm sorry for what I did. Corey had it coming to him. You don't treat any woman the way you treated my mother. I ought to know. After the swell way my real father always acted. Before he... All right, Danny. All right, take it easy. You're just wasting your time, Mr. Valentine. Forget it. Uh-uh, Danny. I can be just as tough as you. I'll be seeing you, kid. <laughs> Miss Brooks, I know Danny admitted he killed Phil, but if anybody's to blame, it's me. Oh, mothers have a habit of blaming themselves, Mrs. Corey. Yeah, but I knew how he worshipped his own father, and yet I married a man like Phil, a man who lived his days in a pool parlor. He wasn't the father I should have picked for my boy. But you had the right to make your own choice. Oh, Danny and his stepfather fought right from the beginning. There was no peace in the house. That's when Danny became an altogether different boy. Started that gang of his. Oh, I suppose I should have known something like this was going to happen. Why do you say that, Mrs. Cole? A few weeks after we were married, Phil was coming upstairs from that pool parlor. Danny was waiting for him. He pushed Phil down the stairs. I opened the door just in time to see him. All Danny did was look at me and walk out. Well, that's just going to make it look all the worse for Danny when he comes up for trial. Oh, I know. I know. Everybody thinks he did it, but I can't believe it. Oh, oh I didn't know you had company, Mrs. Corey. Sorry. Well, that's all right, Mrs. Ravel. Come in. Uh, this is Miss Brooks, a good friend. <laughs> How do you do? Hello. Oh, I do hope you've been able to talk some sense into Mrs. Corey. She can't just sit around moping all day. Well, you've been very kind. Kind, my foot. I know what it means to feel you're all alone in the world. You forget I spent half my life in hall rooms in the strange towns when I was in the chorus line. I, I think I'd better be running along. And you don't have to worry about Mrs. Corey, not a bit, dearie. Uh, like I told her, as long as I own this rooming house, there'll always be a place for her here. And I, I own it outright. Best kind of security for someone in show business. Like my late well, husband used to say... Everybody to be so kind. Oh, now, now. All you need is a good sleep, and I'm going to see that you get it. That's good advice, Mrs. Corey. You'll want to look your best when you see your son. See him? Well, Dan won't talk to me. He won't let me visit him in jail. Well, sometimes things change awfully fast, Mrs. Corey. So suppose we just wait and see. Sudan? Yeah. Who are you? Let's go somewhere and talk. Did you see him in the middle of a fool game? What you trying to do, jinx me? Hey, wait a minute. How'd you know my name? I've never seen you before. Yeah, 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 I'll be right with you. I asked you a question, friend. And what gives? I thought we might have a little talk about what happened to Phil. You know, your business partner. You a dick? No. But I'm not just the inquiring reporter, either. Okay, whoever you are, scram. I got five bucks in this game. What was the deal between you and Corey? The numbers, rackets, slot machines? What was it? I said, beat it. Wouldn't you be at all curious if I told you maybe it wasn't Corey's kid who knifed him? Me? <laughs> I ain't got a curious bone in my body. Okay. Have it your way, Sudan. But I think you can tell me a lot outside. I got one thing to tell you. This looks like the only way. Hold well, it. I'm going to pull Q down the Now tell me what to do, sweet. I'll Give me you. that cue. That's better. I try to run a respectable place. Yeah, talking about that, you better put the pool ball back on the table too, Mac. Mm. Oh, this. Yeah. 
Glad you reminded me. Leo almost got it between his teeth. Swede, this guy's been asking me about Phil Corey. You don't say. Hey, look. Be a nice fellow, Mr. Run Along. Leo wants to finish his game. You and him got a beef. See him later. Somewhere else. Okay, you win. I know when I'm not wanted. But don't get me wrong, pal. I'm not against you personal. Just that I pride myself on running a nice, peaceable recreation parlor. You know, Swede, you're a man with ideals. I like that. But I got a few broken down ideals, too. What's that supposed to mean? I never get kicked out of the same place twice. I mean, and still leave it nice and peaceable. <laughs> Valentine. Huh? Oh, Barney. Hey. Where'd you come from? Oh, I was in that alley there all the time. Oh? Yeah, I was waiting for you to come out of the Swede's place. Now, what do you call this? Bear cat protection? Oh, no, no, no. I just thought you liked some company, that's all. <laughs> hey, what are you carrying there, anyway? It's, it's a camera. Yeah, you ought to see some of the pictures I took with it. Hey, that's a pretty expensive deal. Where'd you get it? Oh, don't worry, Valentine. It's mine, all right. <laughs> I can imagine. Now, what's the real gag, Barney? Huh? One of your club members going to be on my tail all the time? Oh, no, nothing like that. We we know you can take care of yourself. I just happen to uh, be loitering in the alley, it's so. all. Uh, quick, Valentine, huh? get the doorway. Hey, Barney, what is it? Don't ask me no questions. Come on. I wish I could take a picture of it. Hey, what works, Barney? What's going on, Gib? Well, 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 Chuck figured you might be followed when you let the Swede see. So the bear cats were ready on the roofs up and down the street. They must have seen that car was trailing you. How do you like that? But all that stuff out there on the street. Oh, the street cleaning department will clean that all up in the morning. Nothing but ash cans, bricks, cans of garbage, things like that. <laughs> I suppose I should say thanks. <laughs> we wasn't going to let anybody wake you over. And you notice we didn't use no guns or knives. Oh, yeah. Perfect little gentleman. Yeah, that's right. Well, what did you find out about Danny, huh? Nothing much, kid. Except now there are at least two characters who do anything to keep me from finding out what really happened to Phil Corey. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. But first, a word to the wise motorist. If you have an oil filter on your car, remember it needs a little attention now and then. In fact, the filter element should be replaced every 6,000 miles. For after you've had that much service from your oil filter, you'll find the element is bulging with two or three pounds of dirt, most of it carbon and metal particles. And then it can no longer clean the engine oil. So to keep the engine oil in your car cleaner for longer periods, just make sure the oil filter element is replaced every 6,000 miles. It's another speedy service they're glad to do for you at standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Well, you find yourself working with a gang of rough kids called the Bearcats, just about as tough as they come. They won't believe that one of their members, Dan Corey, is guilty of murdering his stepfather. You play along because you don't believe young Danny did it either. And that's why, like George Valentine, you find yourself with Brooksy in the one-room headquarters of the Bearcats right now, addressing the membership. Come on, Danny. Come on. All right, all right now, all you guys. Clam up. Come on, stop yapping, will you? I mean, the meeting will come to order. We got some official business to discuss. Okay, Mr. Valentine, the floor is yours. Oh, yeah, thanks a lot, Chuck. Well, fellas, before I get started, uh, what do you say about unloading some of those uh, harmless weapons your Constitution allows you to carry? Okay, I'm waiting, fellas. Come on now, put them on the table. Well, come on, fellas. You're not afraid to walk down the streets like everybody else without all that stuff. Or are you? Well, okay, okay, you heard what the lady said. Come on, get clean, will you? He said, come on, get clean, will you? That's good. Thank you, Angel. 
say, did you hear that? He called her angel. <laughs> all right, all right, forget it. <laughs> all right, Valentine, what about Danny? I'm coming to that right now. I don't have anything like real proof to clear him. Huh? What? Hey, look, look, we're paying you a hundred bucks. You're supposed to have all the answers. Yeah, that's right, like you said in that ad you had in the paper. Please, boys, let Mr. Valentine finish. You see, fellas, it isn't as easy as you think. Before I can help Danny, you've got to have absolute proof of his innocence. Well, after you left the Swedes and talked to Sudan, somebody tried to get you. That ought to be enough for you to work on. It'd be a lot easier if I was sure we were telling each other all we know about this thing. The truth is, unless I'm sure of that, I'm pretty much of a blind alley. Now, somebody here knows what I mean. Uh, you win, Valentine. Here. No, 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 no. That's an ugly-looking knife. Uh, you see, Danny's old man brought it back with him when he came home to Pacific. He got it off a jap. Now, where did you get it, Chuck? Uh, I might as well tell you the whole thing. See, I was standing on the corner that night right next to the candy store, and... Danny went upstairs for something. The next thing I know, he was giving this to me. He said, uh, make sure you ditch it, Chuck. Then he goes right over and gives himself up to a cop. Well, weren't you afraid that if this knife were found with Danny's fingerprints on it, it'd make the case really open and shut? Yeah, yeah, I thought of that, Angel. I mean, Miss Brooks. Then why were you so careful to preserve the fingerprints, Chuck? I see you got it all wrapped up in a handkerchief. Look, I got more than half a brain, Valentine. If they convicted Danny and he didn't have a chance, I was going to come up with this. Maybe there'll be some other fingerprints on it besides this. Uh-huh. Smart thinking, Chuck. Hey, uh, Brooksy, take this knife down to Lieutenant Riley and ask him to check the prints. Oh, George, you know he's bound to ask questions. Tell him I'll talk to him later. Right now, i got to get to work. But first, Barney. Yeah? All these harmless weapons. Get them, will you? Throw them in the river. Throw them in the river? What's, what's the idea? Now, look, it's up to you guys. Either get rid of this stuff or I forget I ever heard of Danny. He's right. Come on, he's right. Good, that's the idea. Now, with what you told me about the knife, Chuck, maybe I can really start getting places. I told Chuck to get rid of that knife. What's he trying to do to me? Danny... Wasn't that the knife your father brought back from the Pacific just for you? I oh, brought back all kinds of other souvenirs, too. It was hanging over the mantelpiece in the front room. You were very proud of it, weren't you? I, I saw it hanging there. So when I got mad at my... Uh, I mean, at him, I... I grabbed it, and I let him have it. You're lying through your teeth, Danny. The police believe You're me. You're trying to protect somebody. You went right out and gave yourself up. But first, you made very sure you got rid of the knife. Now, why? You asked me that before. Yeah, but this time, I don't need the answer. So long, Danny. I'll still be seeing you. Swede, you and Sudan had me followed last night because you were afraid I might find out you were making book on the races in back of this joint. What are you talking about? I told you, Valentine, I run a peaceable pool party. Or on the other hand, I don't think you would have gone to all that trouble just for that. Maybe it was because the police didn't find just a railroad ticket, the key to his place, and things like that on Corey. They also found quite a lot of toe. The police never overlook anything, do they? Was he trying to get out of town with your cash, boys? Listen, Valentine, I never like to oh, get one more tough, thing. but... Now stop shoving me with that oversized bay window of yours. Speak your piece and get out. Okay. I found a murder weapon, the knife. Now, that ought to tell us who the murderer is. You don't say. Ah, excuse me. I gotta get back to my food game. You, my friend, you're getting out of here. Go on, you hurt me. Go on out. Not before I give way to an impulse I've had since I first saw that big beer belly of yours. <laughs> Well, Brooksy, there's nothing we can do but wait here in the hall till Danny's mother gets back. Uh, may as well sit here on the stairs and make ourselves comfortable. Uh-huh. You don't know the job I had persuading Lieutenant Riley to let me bring this knife back with me. Why'd you want it anyway, George? Oh, just a hunch, Angel. Make him in handy. Hmm. About Danny. When they arrested him, all they found was a key to the door and a couple of dollars in change. For those fingerprints, I don't Put see how... Hold it, Angel. Oh, hello, Mrs. Corey. Oh, 
Miss Brooks. This is Mr. Valentine. Remember, I was telling you about it. Oh, how do you do, how do, you do? Mr. Valentine? Now, look, Mrs. Curry, there's no time to waste. Dan's trial begins tomorrow. Oh, I know. I know that's why I've been out walking and walking, trying to think what to do next. Mrs. Curry, your son thinks you killed your husband. Are you sure, George? What are you saying, Mr. Valentine? When he came in that night, your husband was already dead on the floor. Dan saw the knife. He was sure you did it. Oh, no. He knew the police had reasoned that only two people could be inside here along with Corey, you and he. So he took the blame. That's why it was so important to Dan to get rid of the knife. He didn't want any suspicion to point to his mother. But what am I going to do? I didn't kill Phil, and neither did Danny. Where were you that night, Mrs. Corey? A good, tight alibi had helped. Oh, I don't know where I was. Just like today, I left the house and started walking. Didn't matter where. Phil told me he was going to leave me. I'd lost my son and my husband. I'll get it. Oh. 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 Sorry, Miss Corey. Seems I keep walking in when you have company. Oh, hello, Mrs. Ravel. Hello. Oh. Uh, George, this is Mrs. Corey's landlady. Oh, I'm glad somebody's with you. I wanted you to have this nice hot soup. Oh, thank you. I didn't want to knock on the door and disturb you, but I didn't have my key. Now, just sit down and have some of this. Oh, uh, Mrs. Ravel. Yes? I'd like to talk to you a minute. Could we go in the other room? Oh, I'll take that tray for Mrs. Corey. Uh, talk to me about what, Mr. Valentine? Just a minute. Yes? Mrs. Ravel, I'm doing all I can to help Mrs. Corey and Danny. And I know you are, too. Well, I've done my best. Well, maybe you can do me a favor. You know we found the murder weapon. Oh, you did? Well, I hope it means something. Something good. Yeah, I hope so, too. Now, here's what I'd like you to do. The knife is wrapped in a handkerchief. You'll find it in the desk of the store at 19 and a half Duane Street, the Bearcat Social Club. What? I want you to go over there and get it and bring it back here. But why me, Mr. Valentine? Oh, because I can't leave here and neither can Miss Brooks. You see, we're expecting Lieutenant Riley of the police and a couple of other people. Now, if you'll do this little thing for me, you'll be saving me an awful lot of trouble. Oh, sure. But it'll take me a few minutes to make myself presentable. Well, take your time, Mrs. Ravel. The important thing is, what happens after you come back with that knife? Brooksy, you know what to do. Now, get on it. i got to use that hall phone here. I suppose it would be impolite if I asked what was going on. No time, Angel. I have to call Lieutenant Riley, ask him to have a squad car, pick up Sudan and the suite, and bring him over here. Oh, that's all very enlightening. Now, get going. Mrs. Ravel is not going to take forever to make herself presentable. Now, if I can only get Barney on the phone. So be sure you got it straight, Barney. Remember, I'm depending on you. You're the only one who can do this thing for me. And get over here as soon as you can. So long. All right, Swede, Sudan, you may as well sit down. Why'd the cops pick us up and bring us here? Oh, we'll get to that. Oh, Mrs. Corey, you didn't have any of that soup. She'll have it some other time, Mrs. Ravel. Valentine, nobody's got anything against us. You can't hold us here. Uh-huh. Gentlemen, I told you about the murder weapon. Well, here it is. What are we supposed to do? Faint? Oh, Mr. Valentine, what is it? I can't stand this much longer. I hope you won't have to, Mrs. Corey, and I... Oh. There you are, Mr. Valentine. Took me a little time to get that picture developed. Hey, what what picture, George? Hey, let me see that, Barney. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Huh? Hey, it's the first time I took a picture from inside a closet. <laughs> Turned out good, huh? Yeah, very good, very good. Picture of you, Mrs. Ravel, taking the knife out of the desk. Mom? Well, you told me to do that. You sent me there. I didn't tell you to wipe off the fingerprints as you're doing here in this picture. And that's what she is doing, George. You were afraid your fingerprints would be found on the knife, weren't you, Mrs. Ravel? I never saw that knife before. Sorry, but that won't explain away what you were doing in this picture. Besides, the fingerprints were already taken off the handle down at headquarters. Mrs. Ravel, I can't believe that you'd... Don't be a fool. <laughs> Imagine me calling you a fool. There wasn't a good-looking woman in the whole neighborhood Phil didn't try to make time with. I thought he was going to leave you for me. Then when he told me he was going away, alone, I killed him. And if you didn't, sister, we might have. Corey was taking it on the land with our dough. But, George... Lieutenant Riley found only one set of fingerprints. Just Danny's, I know, yeah. He wiped off what he thought were his mother's fingerprints. Then my fingerprints weren't... No, no. You were quite safe, Mrs. Ravel. Although I suspected you, I had to have proof. And you supplied it. (laughs) 
I want you to put away. All right, all right. Now, all you mugs, clam up, will you? Hey, stop, yes. I, I mean, the banquet will now come to order. <laughs> hey, listen, before we get started, Chuck, I got something to say to Mr. Valentine, and I want the rest of you guys to listen, too, will you? Okay, okay, okay. Uh, I already told you, Mr. Valentine, how I feel after what you did for me. But there's something else. Nobody but you would have gone along with a gang like us. You, you believed everything Chuck told you. You trusted Barney and all of us. You stuck by us. I guess the Bearcats have been a little off the beam. But you can take my word for it. After this, we're going to straighten up and fly ride. We're going to start a baseball team and use those bats the way they were meant to be used. <laughs> well, I, uh... Well, fellas, after that, I, I don't think there's anything to add. Except, uh... Well, let's see. Sure. And don't worry about the food, Mr. Valentine. We paid for it with our own money. <laughs> oh, sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, Mr. Valentine, how did you suspect that Mrs. Ravel anyway? Well, it was all a matter of keys, Barney. Whoever killed Corey had to be inside the apartment. Yeah? When Danny came upstairs that night, he found a key in the door. The police took it as evidence. Mrs. Corey had her key. Oh. Phil Corey's key was found on him. And you, Danny, they found your key on you and you were arrested. Now, the only person who didn't have a key had to knock to get in was, of all people, the landlady. The landlady? How do you like it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Order, order. Come on, everybody. Wait a minute. I've got a motion, hey. What this club needs is an honorary captain. We already decided who it's going to be, huh, fellas? Yeah. Oh, no. Now, wait a minute, fellas. Wait a minute, fellas. You don't... You don't have to do that, after all. Uh, I... Sorry, Mr. Valentine. We was really thinking about Angel. I mean, Miss Brooks. <laughs> what really makes your car go? The big three factors, of course, are ignition, air, and fuel. And that last one, fuel, is mighty important. Most any gasoline mixed with air and then ignited will furnish enough power to make your car go. But to get the most out of your car, try Chevron Supreme gasoline, the premium fuel that's tailored to each different climate and altitude zone. Chevron Supreme has special blending agents that make your car start with a snap. These blending agents also give your car speedy pickup in stop-and-go traffic and smooth, steady power on the open highway. Next time you start out, get peak performance from your car by using Chevron Supreme gasoline. It's available at every standard station and independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... George, the woman's asleep. Maybe it'd be better if we came back in the morning. Brooksy, even when people sleep, they manage to breathe. Huh? Oh. Oh. Look, George. Maybe this empty bottle on the bed table means something. I don't know. This note does. When you will find me, I am dead. I could not tell you the secret of the Montoyas and go on living in peace and honor. Forgive me. Maria. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little, Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Irene Tedrow as Mrs. Corey, Gloria Blondell as Mrs. Ravel, Tommy Cook as Danny, Tony Barrett as Chuck, Sidney Miller as Barney, Herb Litton as Sudan, and Jack Crucian as Swede. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting Service.